Welcome to episode number 18 of the Iron Mike Keenan podcast. Scott Morrison along with Coach Iron Mike. And uh, again this week, hope you're doing well. So far, so good, Scott. Uh, trying to stay protected like the rest of the world and uh, being reasonable what uh, kind of activities you get involved with. So bicycling in uh, Key West, uh, I can keep my distance. So that's what I do for exercise every day. And stay warm too, which some of, very us are, warm. Yeah. some of us are struggling to do so, but notwithstanding that, that's great to hear. Um, we just went through, or we're continuing to go through, I guess I should say, the free agent signing period in the NHL. Normally July 1st is the magic date, and now we're in October, the world upside down. But I got to ask you, because you were a general manager for several years, and, and I mean, I covered so many July 1st. What is it like, because you come from humble beginnings and all of us, a lot of us did, and what is it like when you're throwing around millions of dollars, somebody else's money, thankfully, but millions of dollars at players? What is that feeling like? Well, that's a very interesting question because uh, I can go back to my first year in Philadelphia in the National Hockey League, 1984-85, the entire payroll was $2 million. And wow. Mark Howell was getting the most money at $250,000 a year. Now I can go back to my coaching days in Boston and relay a little story to you about how these young hockey players uh, are getting incredible amount of money. So Billy Guerin as playing for me in Boston with Joe Thornton and a fellow named Samsonoff was the line and, and Joe, Joe was coming to his, into his own and, but Billy had a great, great year. So at 1201 uh, Eastern standard time, Billy gives me a call. He says, thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot for everything. I said, what is it, Billy? He says, I just signed for $49 million. So <laughs> I said, great, that's good for you. So that's just an example of, uh, what had transpired, of course, Wayne Gretzky, I think, really pushed the envelope financially for all players. Of course he did. Uh, but now, uh, as you see these signings, uh, it is incredible and, and uh, very competitive. Uh, I know that the agents work overtime when they know that type of money is coming their way and try to, tr try to uh, put them in a financial position that would set them up for life that if they look after their money, uh, uh, they'll be set, their families will be set. And, uh, and it's a strategy going into free agency that uh, most try to take advantage of. Yeah. I mean, and, and a little bit more tempered this year, just because the salary cap has been flattened out for a couple of years because of everything that's going on in the real world. But uh Interesting times and just so much money flying around and I realized short careers and, and all the rest of it. So you have to cash in when you can. And uh, so we'll get on with the, our podcast. And in, in recent weeks, we've been talking about a lot of the, the great players who uh, crossed your path that you coached in uh, either with the club teams or Canada cups or uh, other ventures. And, um, We'll do a little bit of a different spin today. We've talked about a lot of Hall of Famers, and we're going to talk about different Hall of Famers, a different Hall of Fame, the Enforcers Hall of Fame. And you, the game has changed now, and I, I, I want to get your perspective on how you feel about what the hockey's like today, and we've talked about it in early episodes, but more so with respect to some of the guys that you had on your team when you think of the Enforcers. And it's fitting that as we're taping – this episode today that it's uh, the 71st birthday of Dave the Hammer Schultz from the Broad Street Bullies. Really, yes. Of course, you started with Philadelphia after that. So, uh, so we're going to talk about some of the enforcers. So, before we get to the individuals, your thoughts about the role enforcers had back in the day and how you don't mm -hmm. see that type of player now. Well, back uh, when I began, and of course I'm in Philadelphia and, and I've spoken about it before, about having a reputation or having a persona as a team and the Broad Street Bullies and, and 
Bobby Clark became a general manager and was my boss and said, we have to continue to have a personality. And we were one of the most penalized teams in the league, but one of the most successful teams in the league. And part of that personality was a rugged edge, a tough team, a competitive team and an intimidating team. And uh, we were very, like it was great for the television and yourself as a writer to follow us because there's always going to be an interesting story. And uh, our ratings were very high when we were on television, uh, not only locally and, and all our games were with Mr. Snyder at Spectrum and he started his own TV programming. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was part of the game. It was intimidating uh, to play teams that had enforcers that uh, could play a little bit, fill a role, and, and uh, have an important influence on the game itself. I'm not so sure that, that that portion or part of the game exists, and there's a great debate whether it should exist or not, but I can tell you some great stories about individuals that were not only great hockey players, but really tough, intimidating players. And uh, some people, how they fit in with the group. And, and uh, we can begin actually uh, mentioning a few of the names. For example, Dave Brown was a young kid. He was 21 years old when I had him. And he had a presence in the locker room. And, and So just uh, before you go there, yes. should there be fighting in hockey? I'm going to put you on the spot. Yes, there should be. It's a, a historically a part of the game. It always has been. You go back to the great players, and I'm going to name a couple. Uh, Gordy Howe uh, was involved in fisticuffs, but the, identified as the best player. Bobby Orr was involved in fisticuffs. Uh, Mark Rocket Methier, Richard. Rocket Richard. I was just going to mention him as well. So for me, uh, the idea, I believe, the genesis of it was almost uh, a practical solution in the fact that each player has a club in his hand. And that club could be very, very dangerous. That means the stick. So to sort things out, uh, the men in, in the league decided that they're going to fight each other rather than hit each other with a dangerous weapon. And they weren't wearing helmets at the time. So... Uh, yeah, I, the one thing that amazes me today, though, they all have a shield on, so they start punching, and it's like counterproductive, unless you get the helmet off. And I can give you an example of Jerome Ginla. Jerome Ginla fought uh, Jovanovski, and before they fought, and both tough guys, both of them took their helmets off because they both had shields on, and they said, "Nope, we're going to fight." and we're going to fight with their helmets off. So they dropped the helmets to the ice, and then they, they – and the officials let them fight. So – and that's not that long ago. I was coached in 2009 with Jerome as our captain in Calgary. And, the, again, another, another example of a, a great player who was also a very tough competitor and, a, and didn't mind dropping his gloves, as some of the people we just mentioned. So, uh, yeah, I – you can put me on the spot, and, and I still believe in it. I still believe it's a part of the game that uh, we should not lose. So you mentioned Dave Brown and six foot five, two hundred and five pounds when he played for you in Philadelphia. That was, I mean, everybody's grown uh, since back, and that was a long time ago. But that was a really huge man at that time. Yeah, and, and he was he had a role. He knew his role. He was only going to play about five minutes a game. Uh, him and the, he had a sidekick, Daryl Stanley, um, and they would uh, get themselves ready. I'll tell you one thing about tough guys. You're trying to get your team ready and prepared mentally to play. The tough guys were never a problem because they had to get themselves ready. They knew what was upcoming. They knew what they had to face when they got on the ice. And the and the real possibility is they're going to get involved with fisticuffs. So uh, Brownie was always ready, and his sidekick was Daryl Stanley. And then we had some other tough guys on that team that uh, came about. Uh, Craig Berube, coaching now St. Louis, he shows up. I'll tell you a quick story about Craig Berube in his first uh, game with me. 
were playing the Red Wings and out comes this guy named Probert and oh my goodness, he filled Chief in and I go into the locker room after the first period and his eyes swollen and his lips are cut. And he said, Mike, honest to God, I can fight a lot better than that. I said, I hope so because your judgment uh, was courageous, but uh, the results weren't that good. So he was a good example of a guy who was involved and he knew his role. But another fellow, a couple of fellows we had in that team too that were really tough was Rick Tockett. He's now coaching the NHL as well and a fierce competitor, but he had no problem. Every time we played Washington, for example, him and Scott Stevens would fight. It was going to be automatic. And Scott had a real temper as well and liked to get involved. Timmy Kerr was a mountain of a man. He could fight. Nobody wanted to tangle with him. So it was a big part of our, our personality. Uh, then we had Hospitar and even Shell Samuelson was lethal with a stick and a number of players, so Mellonby didn't mind getting involved, and I'm going to miss a couple. Carson, Sutters, uh, they're all well, your goalie players. didn't. Your goalie wasn't and shy. Got, actually, after Belly, so uh, he, he 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 relished it. So yeah, we built the team around that, and then of course in in uh, I can tell you a story when I went to Chicago, and again Probert, God bless his soul, is is the is the uh, fellow that we're talking about. I can't believe I dis- did this as a coach. So I walk into the dressing room before for the pregame talk, and I said, okay, who's going to be first? That's all I said. And they looked at me, and then three of them jumped up and said, I am Bobby McGill, Big Daddy, Wayne yes. Van Gorp, and Dave Madsen. And, the, and who's going to be first? Well, who's going to first be first to fight Probert? So three fights, and you're out. So Bobby McGill fights him first. He comes out of the penalty box. I don't know what probably was thinking. He fights Van Dorp right away. Van Dorp goes right over. And then he comes out of the box. He fights Manson. And, of course, now he's out of the game. And the Manson fight went from goal line to goal line in the old Chicago Stadium. And the place was going crazy. And that's another thing we didn't talk about. I mean, how, how many times do people sit down when a f- fight breaks out at a hockey game? Nobody. Everybody stands. So, so Proby's out and we win the game for fun because now the intimidation factor, we had a tough team in Chicago too, uh, became most penalized and again, great success, but it was a factor. We, no one wanted to play the Blackhawks. Nobody wanted to play uh, the Philadelphia Flyers and, and those tough guys had a big role. And then I went on and got Stu Grimson and he told the story about him bleeding all over me and, the linesman bringing him over, and I've got a hold of him to keep him out of a, a fist of cuffs, and he almost breaks my arm to break loose. And, and then, meanwhile, this white shirt I got on with a nice suit is all red because he's bleeding all over me. And so that, that goes on national TV. Uh, the Grim Reaper, he was called. And so we had a number of people, like even Dirk Graham, a real tough competitor. He could really. Uh, fight the uh, Chelios. I mean, we're talking about guys that are mean and competitive and I won't go on and we had cider I guess, again, and they got involved. So they, they were a big part of the solution, even going into, into up now into New York with uh, the Rangers. I mean, Mark Messi was mean, tough. He's our leader. And then well, we look at Joe Kosher, the knockout King, one punch, Joe, he'd knock you right out. I mean, we had Bukaboom. We had people there as, as well that uh, didn't shut. My toe and Noonan, they could fight. Both of them could fight uh, exceptionally well. So, um, you know, there was, a again, a, a tough personality, a, a very successful team, but a, a very intimidating team in many ways. And, and they were intimidating because they were successful in terms of our play, but also physical. And uh, then I can go on and we won't, you know, St. Louis, I have a number of guys the rest of my career. So uh, to sort of give it some kind of focus now about tough guys in the league and, and what we're doing today uh, in relationships to, I don't know if, if I can name a team right now that has a super personality that I would identify with as a fan. And put people that, you know, obviously there's no people in the seats now, but to put people in the seats, uh, the bad uh, Boston Bruins at one time or 
you know, the big bad Bruins and so on, the history of it all. So, uh, you know, those teams in, in Detroit, when they won the Cups, they had tough, tough teams. And the Islanders, big uh, Clark, uh, Clark Gillies. Uh, I mean, they had tough, competitive teams. John Ferguson in Montreal. So, uh, um, you know, it's an interesting evolution of the game. I'm not saying it's not as exciting or it's as fast or, but there's some parts of it I think that we should savor and, and keep part of the hockey culture, if you like. So two points is one is virtually every name that you mentioned were guys that obviously they could fight, they were physical, but they could play. Yes. They could take a regular shift. They weren't just an extra body at the end of the bench. And, you know, to your point about putting people in seats, if that was possible at this point, we do have some of the greatest skilled players, but we don't have that other element of the game. I agree. And, and uh, back in the day when I began, you could only dress 19 players. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, so that some teams debated on how are we going to formulate that fourth line or extra defenseman, whatever the case might be. And that might be a game, game day decision, game time, depending on the opposition. Uh, but then went to 20 and now you can formulate. And yeah, some of these guys only played five, six minutes, but we, we talked about a guy like Probert, the toughest guy in the league. Look at the minutes he played. I mean, uh, there's some, and I have a lot of legitimate guys that uh, could play, a regular shift and more. And again, I bring up Rick Talk as a good example. Uh, you know, at the level where he, he can play in, in Team Canada and Canada Cup. So, but, you know, Mess was no slouch either. So, you know, we make comparisons uh, with these great players and, and the elk of uh, Gordy Howe and, and his, and, and even Bobby Orr was a a fierce competitor and a fighter whenever he, he felt was necessary to help his team. And that's the other part of it is that I enjoyed coaching the guys that were part of that solution or part of that personality that fought for their team, not for themselves. There are some guys who just fight for themselves to rack up minutes and, and so on. But we had some great team, team players, uh, uh, you know, and all various stops. And, you know, I go back to Brad May in, in uh, Vancouver. Pertuzzi is a big guy. And so, you know, and I'm skipping over. We had lots of guys in St. Louis. And, uh, you know, we had dangerous fighters there. Uh, so Twist was one of them. Uh, and so, Chase. And Chase, yeah. So it was a different era, but a different time. But the teams uh, coming into Chicago, I remember bringing Philadelphia into the Chicago stadium and they had Secord and they had some tough guys, uh, uh, defensemen uh, that uh, was terrorizing the league. And even uh, God bless uh, uh, the captain who was killed in the car accident, uh, Magnuson, Keith Magnuson, he was a scrapper. But going up those stairs in Chicago with the Philadelphia Flyers, I never had to ever worry about getting my team ready. When we were going up those stairs and that organ was thunderous, we were ready. <laughs> you know, sometimes coaches have to work at that prep and get the team motivated and get them in, 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 in focused. There was no problem doing that. Or teams coming into, into Philadelphia felt the same way. They had no problem getting themselves prepared because they knew they, they were in for a competitive game. The adage used to be when I was coaching Chicago – Team to say, we just want to get out of here alive. We don't even care about the two points at the time. So, uh, again, uh, the teams became that had that element became all had superstars, like we're talking about now, the skilled superstar players, but we also had very tough, competitive, intimidating teams. And I don't know if that exists today. You can maybe, uh, elaborate on that a little bit but uh I, I don't see it to be the same no it's a, it's a different a different chemistry now for sure there's still a lot of tough players it's a hard nose game 
but a different uh, kind of situation. And if you're on the fourth line, you got to put in quality minutes, as they say, and, and all the rest of it. But uh, And the physicality of the game has changed a little bit as well. But let's talk about some of the people. And, you know, you mentioned uh, – well, the, the, one, the Dave Brown story that I enjoy because you were in Philadelphia and he's a, a Saskatoon kid, but uh, his brother, and you would remember this as a little aside, but his brother, uh, and you played Edmonton in two Stanley Cup finals, but his brother was the bartender at Sherlock Holmes Pub across yeah. from the Weston Hotel where we had more than one or two drinks over the course of time. So that was kind of a funny thing. And uh but talk about Craig Berube. I mean, here's a guy. And one of the things I always loved about guys, the, the tougher guys, I guess we'll call them, are the enforcers. But, uh, you know, Dave now is head of pro scouting for Philadelphia, Dave Brown. Craig, as you mentioned, uh, you know, has, has coached in various places and won a Stanley Cup a year ago with uh, – a year or so ago with uh, St. Louis – but a lot of these guys were cerebral guys too. Like they were just thugs. These were guys oh, who were thinkers. They're very bright, and uh, their persona many times uh, outgrew actually their philosophical approach to life. And Brownie is a good example. Very bright guy. Yeah. But he would never let anybody on the opposition know that he he just wanted to look and. And and speak like he was he was going to be a scary dude, and he was. So another, I talked about his sidekick Daryl Stanley. So I go to practice, and it's in the fall, uh, and no Daryl. And I say to the guys, "Well, where's where's Daryl? Where where is he?" And finally, they they didn't want us to tell me anything. So finally, one of them chirped up, and it was Brown. He says, "Mike, he's gone hunting." It's bow and arrow time in Manitoba, and he's gone back to bear hunt. I said, are you kidding me? He said, no. He said, he'll be back in two or three days. He's got to hit his bear, and then he'll be back. I said, okay. So some great stories about uh, their presence in the locker room. They're very meaningful, though. Uh, uh, a guy like Dave Brown would uh, – and, you know, we haven't alluded to it, but even in Edmonton with Wayne – and Wayne Gretzky and Semenko, God bless Dave yeah. as well, uh, riding shotgun. I mean, there was a fear if you didn't have tough guys that somebody would take advantage of your stars if they weren't physical. Nobody had to worry about Mark Messi, but you had to worry about Wayne, Wayne Gretzky. And Slats made sure he got McSorley and uh, Semenko and various other people that – that their presence was well announced when we played Edmonton Oilers. Uh, and again, look at that. They have a dynasty and they have a tough team. And uh, the understanding by the general manager and coach is also a Hall of Famer and ex player. And Glenn Sather, he understood what was necessary to protect Wayne and, and the other valuable stars, Paul Coffey, uh, you know, and Hall of Famers, Yuri Curry. Uh, so it was important. And, and uh, you know, you look at this McDavid, I don't know how that plays out now in the league or, or Sidney Crosby in the transition over time, how that plays out. So uh, there was a, a necessary component in building a team as a manager. And you mentioned I was a manager for years and, and other managers that that was very important component and the players uh, accepted it and, and respected it. Uh, you know, you got Hunter in Cal Calgary. So that rival alone between Edmonton and Calgary down the road uh, was fierce and intimidating and physical. And when Bob Johnson was involved with the Calgary Flames with Cliff Fletcher, they built that team. And, and Cliff was a big proponent of that as well when he, when he's building all of his teams and, even the Maple Leafs at Wendell Clark, a good example of a, a star player like talking, extremely tough. So, uh, yeah, they, they, they add an element and, and uh, that element I don't know exists today. And, and uh, I thought it, it added something to the sport of hockey. Hockey uh, was perceived and is perceived as 
a tough competitive game, a fierce competitive game. And, and maybe we see it today and maybe we saw some of the playoffs. And it's interesting if we reflect upon it, though, back in those days when we're talking about those great players, there wasn't a lot of fighting in the playoffs, except some examples. And I will go back to Montreal when we had the brawl. So uh, Knuckles Nyland is chirping at our bench. And I stood up on the bench and I said, who are you talking to? What, what's going on here? You try to intimidate this bench? He says, who are you? I says, I'm a guy that likes guys like you. And if you keep it up, I'm going to trade for you. Well, the whole bench started to laugh. He started to laugh. I says, I love guys like you. So come on over. So the next game we go into Montreal, he comes right up to our bench after the first whistle. He says, Mike, I'm waiting for the trade. So, <laughs> so they had a great sense of humor as well, uh, even though they had a, a dynamic role on the team. I remember Marty McSorley when he was, well, Edmonton and L.A., he told me the story. He said at the start of a game, if it got a little bit goofy at the start, he'd go to the other team's bench and he'd look at the, the best player, their star player, and he says, are you feeling lucky tonight? And the guy would look at him and he said, what, what are you talking about? He says, because if these clowns don't start messing with Gretz, I'm coming after you. Yeah. I'm not worrying about them. You're on my list. And it was like, okay, now we got peace in our time and, and everything sorted itself out. You know, that's exactly what the, the strategy was. It was, it was, we're going to, we're going to have a dance, but we're going to pick the partners yeah. and, and Brownie would do the same thing or talk or uh, Rick talk or all the tough guys, they would go to the top players on the other team and say, you don't want to have me visiting you. So, you know, tell your tough guys not to bother Pelly Eklund or Dave Poole or Brian Prop or whoever the case might be. Uh, but the more of the, the, the top players you had that were competitive, like I can't name a player. Right, Ronick was our top sentiment, but he, he, that didn't bother him at all. As a, or Steve Larmer, that didn't bother him at all either. So uh, that type of, team filled out very quickly and even uh, if i go back to our rangers championship team that uh, that didn't bother red hall wasn't bothered by th stuff like that either and and then of course shanahan i had him early and he was tough and competitor so you know those things and pronger i mean the mountain of a man to begin with and mean so you know i'm just reflecting upon some of the teams and some of the tough guys but as we referred a lot of the guys that were tough, the, I mentioned Billy Garen, the 49 million, he was tough as could be as well. And even Joe Thornton as a kid. So, you know, there was a, a different mentality. Maybe it was the way that they were brought up, what they had to do to, get, to arrive in the NHL. Um, and uh, maybe the, the rules were different. Uh, uh, when I first started, uh, there was no penalty for an aggressor. That's yeah. way back when. But then they instituted the aggressor penalty. And so uh, times have changed. And I'm not saying it's not for the best or for the betterment of the game. But that part of the game, to me, uh, when, it, when it erupts or it comes to the surface now, you see the fans react and how excited they get. And the, the teams themselves, the players – you know, they, they don't mind it. I, I think that they, they still have a feeling for it. It's just not uh, in the context of being able to demonstrate it as often. Did you see, and, and I, I agree with everything you said there, and, and we do see a difference between regular season and playoffs still, that uh, the rules change and the, the intensity and, the and physicality right, and officiating, yeah. Did you see... Barube and Tockett, so we're, we'll continue with the Philly theme. You see, I, did you see at the time or think at the time that either one of those would become successful coaches? No, I didn't. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, but I wasn't looking for it. Um, Rick Tockett, uh, you know, he, he made the plea to me at one time that I could be better than a third liner, which I started him as. 
And of course he succeeded and become a top scorer. And Craig, uh, like many of the others, started out with that, maybe that role of being an enforcer, but became a capable player of playing and playing minutes. So uh, they made the adaptation to their own game. And of course, uh, they loved the game and wanted to be involved and they evolved into coaches, paying their dues, coaching at different levels and learning and understanding that part of, the, of, of their trade of, of becoming a coach. And now both are very successful coaches and both were very, very tough competitors, fighters and tough competitors as well. Yeah, and good people. And great people. Yeah, absolutely. You no, know, that's the other thing. <laughs> Hockey players are great guys. And these tough guys, as I said, mix in, but they're so well respected in the locker room and they respect the team. Uh, hockey players have a great deal of respect for each other uh, on and off the ice. Uh, but they had to learn to separate that at times to become the intimidating forces that they were. Absolutely. Okay, with that, we'll wrap episode number 18. More great stories and uh, great people. And uh, we'll continue on that theme with our next episode, number 19. And uh, until then, Mike, the best to you and uh, all our viewers and listeners. And uh, stay safe and stay well.